Welcome to our series on China and its place in the Bible and in history. This is a five-part series. The first in our series was China's origins in the book of Genesis. This one, the Sinite migration to China. And then next in the series, China's 100 years of humiliation, commencing in about 1840. And then the fourth study in the series will look at China's astonishing rise to power in the last four decades. And then China's future in God's plan. It's all there in the Bible for us. This is session two, the Sinite migration to China. The first thing we want to do is to look at Strong's Concordance because it's uh, probably regarded as uh, one of the best authorities on the Hebrew language used in the Bible. And you can see there the relationship of the names given in the Bible, Sin, the Sinites, the Sinai, the mountains in the Sinai Peninsula, and Sinim mentioned in Isaiah chapter 49 as a country far off in the distant east. Now these numbers in Strong's, as you can see, are consecutive, so the names are well and truly related. The first is the wilderness of Sin, mentioned in the region of Sinai when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. Then the Sinites, mentioned back in Genesis chapter 10, uh, in relation to the descendants of Canaan. Then uh, the mountain, of course, Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula. And then the distant oriental region, in the extremity of the known world, right across on the far east of the Eurasian landmass, identified with southern China. So all those uh, taken from Strong's Concordance, and we'll talk about some other authorities that uh, give us support in our understanding of China in the Bible a little bit later. So as we've mentioned, the Sinites settled in that area of the wilderness of Sin and the region of Mount Sinai for at least a couple of hundred years. Around them were other descendants of Ham, also the Assyrians, Asher, uh, who Asher was a descendant of Shem. So Ham's descendants moved further south. Canaan, the lands uh, in the uh, Promised Land, the area of, the, of Israel today. Uh, there's Egypt, Mitzrayim, Ethiopia and Libya. And we've mentioned that the Sinites migrated to the east. Now that was in the period about 2100 to 2000 BC. The Sinites, according to Genesis 9 and 10, uh, the word is used there, scattered abroad or spread abroad. The Sinites are scattered abroad to the land of Sinim. When they found there, when they got there, a very beautiful country at the far east, as far as they could go by land. Now, the earliest mention we've got in history of the peoples living in China is about the year 2070 BC. Abraham arrived in the land in about 2000 BC, and there is mention of Canaanites there, but no mention of the Sinites, because no doubt they had already begun their migration across to the east. They'd been living in pretty harsh conditions in the wilderness of Sin and the area of Sinai and that desert area between the south of the Dead Sea and the Red Sea. A pretty harsh area, as we know, because the children of Israel found it so when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it's very much that way today. So why did they migrate? Probably because uh, they were expanding in numbers. We know the Chinese uh, have multiplied uh, to become the greatest uh, population upon the earth. So the Sinites probably found that the conditions in the desert and the uh, ability to uh, contain large numbers of population uh, wasn't there. And so they had to move elsewhere. Now, they couldn't very well go west because that's where Egypt and Libya and Ethiopia were. They couldn't go south. They couldn't very well go north because Japheth was there and Japheth also occupied, we're told, uh, the islands to the west. So they had to go east. Now that meant, and they were ready for this, that they needed to cross some pretty harsh deserts. The Arabian Desert, the Taklamakan Desert and the Gobi Desert, amongst the worst desert environments anywhere on the earth and uh, they were able to handle that and uh, over time they transferred across to the east uh, skirted around to the north of the Himalayas and eventually came to this surprisingly amazingly beautiful country of China a lush country well watered well able to sustain a large population and well contained and protected by the regions around it the sea to the east of course and impenetrable deserts and mountains to the west. So they felt very, very secure and safe. And there they could develop, well, their own culture, 
their own uh, understanding of religion and they could forget all about God and they could develop uh, themselves as a nation self-contained uh, away from everybody else. The map here shows the routes of the Silk Road. Now these would have been the kind of routes on the land there uh, that they would have travelled as they moved across to the east and you can see that uh, this map tells us that the country that they arrived at in the Far East was known as Sinai, China today. Now those routes of course became the Silk Road when they travelled back east with their goods in centuries later to trade with the West. They knew the routes very well. Those who hadn't travelled those routes on the, from the West didn't really know uh, what was happening on the far side of the uh, landmass of Eurasia and uh, that it was very mysterious as far as the people in the West were concerned for centuries and centuries. Now historians had tried to discover who these people were in the Far East and we see first of all in the records of Strabo and Josephus, now they were both historians, Strabo was uh, also a geographer uh, and uh, he studied the Silk people and he called them the Ceres people. Now he believed that the silk traders brought the product with them from origins in India. It wasn't until a little later, about a hundred years later, beginning in the second century AD, that along came Claudius Ptolemy. Now he was a mathematician, a historian and a geographer as well. And uh, he was the first to discover the true origin of the silk from the Sinai people, much, much further across to the east. So he saw that the Ceres were me merely intermediaries along the route and uh, they helped station by station to bring the silk right across from the east to the west. Now in Isaiah chapter 49 we read about the land of Sinim and it's about the Chinese people in the future in fact and it talks about the kingdom of God and people who will come to worship at Jerusalem in the kingdom. And the prophet says, Behold, these shall come from far. Lo, these from the north, some from the west, and there will be those from the land of Sinim. As we said, Ptolemy said, they are the Sinai people from the far east, modern day China. Supporting him, Manasseh ben Israel, who was a, a very, very well respected Jewish scholar in the 1600s, and uh, Jesenius later, and Keelan de Litch, Strong's getting more recent, Brown Driver Briggs in their uh, lexicons, and uh, Henry Morris, who was uh, in the 1970s one of the authors of the book The Genesis Flood, well-known book, and he wrote other books as well, and he identified the land of Sinem with China. This map that we're looking at now shows the uh, spreading abroad of the nations of the world from the tribes of Japheth, Ham and Shem from the time of Noah's Ark right through until the 15th century. And you can see that the blue arrows representing Japheth uh, spread abroad to uh, Europe and uh, those regions there and the uh, tribes of Shem stayed very much in the area of the Middle East and perhaps Northern Africa but it's the Ham tribes that spread right abroad around the world and of course among those was the Sinites who went to China. The builders of the ark, largely uh, Ham continue the traditions of being great builders, as we've already said. The uh, line of Ham became great builders all around the world. And uh, from the Tower of Babel, uh, they also built the pyramids uh, in Egypt and elsewhere, Central America and so on, other great and mighty cities. And you can see Machu Picchu there in South America. The Sinites themselves seem to have been builders too. Perhaps they were involved in the building of Petra because they lived in that general region. We know that uh, the area, whole area there is known in the Bible uh, in later times as Mount Seir, uh, the home of Esau and the Edomites. Now Esau took over that area and drove out the tribes that were already there, but he had in fact married into the tribes that inhabited that area. One of his wives was a Hivite, uh, which was a branch of the Horites. And uh, so it was logical that his uh, uh, family would take over and inhabit that area uh, in the area of Edom, uh, which is uh, very much southern Jordan today. And there was Petra. Now, when you go to Petra today, uh, you'll probably be told that uh, the Nabateans <laughs> were uh, the people who built Petra. The Nabateans were actually a nomadic Arab tribe. And uh, historians and uh, archaeologists are now 
starting to discover that, in fact, uh, Petra is much, much older than the Nabateans. And uh, it seems that it does go right back uh, to the time uh, prior to Esau, when the Horites began the building uh, in that area. Now, the, the name Horites actually means a rock dweller, a, a troglodyte, a cave dweller, one who builds their home among the rocks. And that's precisely what took place there. So the Sinites may have had a hand in the early construction of the region of Petra. In fact, it's very interesting in support of that, that uh, just recently in 2017, there was a sister city relationship established between Petra and a city in the west of China, the Jiayu Pass city, on the far western limits of China's Great Wall. And uh, it's more or less the uh, western end of the Silk Road, the beginning of the Silk Road, the western end from China, and the beginning of the Silk Road running across the deserts to the west. This establishment of a uh, city relationship between the two, sister city, was in recognition of the fact that there was much archaeological, historical and structural in the way of similarities between the two cities. And of course, it draws tourists to both areas. Here you can see on the map uh, where the Jeyu Pass is, on the edge of the 13,000 mile long Great Wall of China. And the similarities are really quite remarkable uh, between Petra and the, the construction of the Great Wall of China. So, as we said, the Sinites have migrated across to the east. They've taken their building skills with them, as the other tribes of Ham exhibited building skills, and particularly, of course, in Egypt, you can see the pyramids there. And here is the Great Wall of China in the land of Sinim, 13,000 miles long. Still, the Great Wall is the most popular place for tourists to visit in China, attracting millions of people each year. Yes, the uh, Great Wall of China. It's considered one of the seven wonders of the modern world. And it's the only man-made structure that uh, you can see from space. Uh, it's uh, built largely of brick, uh, right across its whole length, uh, and uh, the mortar was given special strength by adding sticky rice. So uh, next time you're having your sticky rice pudding, think of the Great Wall of China and uh, think what that's doing to your stomach. <laughs> yes, the Tower of Babel was actually built of bricks, and uh, uh, it was, of course, uh, quite a structure. We don't know uh, a lot about it, but it was significant enough for God to send his angels down to stop the building of it because they wanted it to reach right up to heaven. Uh, they said, let's make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone because uh, in the uh, region of the uh, Euphrates Valley, uh, there wasn't the great stone that uh, the uh, descendants uh, uh, of Ham had when they uh, went down to, into Egypt, Mitzrayim. Uh, they had uh, lots of stone there to build their pyramids, but there wasn't the stone in the Euphrates Valley, so they built brick out of brick, very strong bricks, burning them throughly. And uh, they used bitumen there for mortar. Uh, that wasn't available in uh, China where they were building the Great Wall, so they used the sticky rice pudding. They said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Well, as we've already shown, the scattering abroad did happen. And in the early chapters of Genesis, the emphasis is that the Canaanites were scattered abroad. Which Canaanites? The Sinites scattered very, very far abroad, right to the east. So uh, the uh, uh, Great Wall, according to Xi Jinping now, is a great wall of steel that they built in modern times. Chinese we all know that walls are built by those who feel a sense of insecurity, and that's certainly the case with China. It was in the past. Uh, they felt insecure against the Mongol hordes from the north and other enemies that they perceived, and so they built the Great Wall for their 
protection because they feel vulnerable. And as we know, the descendants of Canaan were told, you're going to be servants to other people. Well, the Chinese built the Great Wall because they did fear being enslaved to others. Remember when the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan, the great thing that worried them was the great walls that they saw around the cities built by the Canaanites. So the Chinese being descendants of the Canaanites, uh, certainly we uh, are aware that uh, they built a great wall and uh, they were wall builders from very, very early on. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the Canaanite city of Jericho was one of those cities that the uh, Bible tells us the children of Israel were, were very worried because they were walled up to heaven, great strong walls. Well, we know what happened to the great walls of Jericho uh, when the children of Israel encircled it and uh, without, uh, as it were, any uh, battering rams or anything to break down those walls, God broke down the walls and uh, we think that's a message for Xi Jinping in these last days, the great wall of protection that China has put up, uh, will not stand the forces that God will bring uh, against uh, the enemies of uh, God in the last days when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So the Sinites, as we said, they've eventually arrived at the greatest agricultural land in the whole of Eurasia. It is a very beautiful land and can uh, look after a great population because it's a uh, a very arable land and uh, the farming in that area is uh, interesting and quite unique. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, watered that whole area in the eastern China and uh, more than 90% of the population of China is in that uh, eastern section. Uh, and the Yellow River and the Yangtze River flow down from the uh, Himalayan mountains and provide uh, constant and wonderful watering in that area in addition to the fact that it also receives good rainfalls on a very regular basis. It starts with the Yellow River Civilization. And there's a good reason why this settlement grew into the most populous country in the world. The floodplain of the Yellow River is some of the best agricultural land in the world. In fact, the entirety of eastern China is perfectly suited for agriculture. This was and still is crucial to the country's success. What's more, this area is just warm and wet enough that farmers can do what is known as double cropping. Once the main crop of rice is cultivated in June and July, another slightly less productive crop can be planted for October cultivation. This increases rice output by about 25%, which means China can make more food using the same amount of land. Europe mostly relies on wheat to feed its population, which only outputs 4 million calories of food per acre of farmland. Rice, on the other hand, grows 11 million calories worth per acre. It's easy to see why there are so many people in China. Now, we know quite a lot about the Canaanite uh, history uh, associated with China. Uh, as Henry Morris uh, wrote in his book, The Genesis Record, he also, as we mentioned, read, wrote the, uh, the book, The Genesis of Flood with another gentleman. Um, the Canaanites, he says, have been the servants of mankind. That's in fulfillment of the curse that was placed upon uh, Canaan uh, in the early chapters of Genesis, Genesis 9, 10 and 11. Uh, very interesting to read in that regard. In China, the land of Sinim, the Sinites, as Henry Morris confirms, uh, they invented down through history uh, as uh, servants of mankind, uh, providing services to other members of the human race. Many of the concepts that we use even today in practical mathematics, surveying, navigation, in fact, they even invented the compass. And uh, they developed paper and ink uh, for writing and then printing. And uh, the, the first movable type printing press was invented in China. And they were the first to introduce paper money. They also uh, invented and developed the use of gunpowder. And of course, uh, that's not only for fireworks, but for weapons, as we were, are aware. Uh, some of the attributes of the Chinese people that uh, make them quite unique uh, as the Sinites, uh, as we said, the servant people, they became st quite strong people and uh, hardworking people, very industrious and uh, inventive, very, very clever. And they're also very high achievers and they're willing to take lots of risks. And we know that uh, worldwide they're known as gamblers and they have a very materialistic culture. Uh, very important to them within their culture, the uh, attributes of wealth and of status. 
They're also uh, very inscrutable people, very hard to read what they're thinking at any one time. Uh, they also have, uh, because of their uh, perceived servant status in the world uh, and uh, the, the history that's developed through that, uh, have a great fear of being shamed and of being humiliated. Now, this is all part of the curse that was placed upon them uh, as uh, God cursed uh, Canaan and his descendants through Noah. They, uh, they feel that they mustn't lose face in any, uh, in any uh, environment, in any circumstances. And uh, they're also, uh, as, uh, uh, as they have descended uh, through this uh, period of uh, servitude to other races, they've uh, been quite uh, prepared to become a collective society and uh, work together under uh, a firm set of rules. Uh, and they're very suspicious of outsiders, as we would be aware. And that's uh, shown up in their recent history in the last uh, 150 years in particular that we'll look at soon in our next session. Um, they, they were so far away from other civilization, driven so far, scattered abroad, uh, that um, as time went on, and we know that they were scattered in the area of around about 2,200 BC, when we get down to the 300s BC, we get to Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, as we know, was a great conqueror uh, of uh, much of the world of his day, as he understood it. And uh, when he get, got across as far east as the Indus River, which is around about the, the area of Pakistan and the west of India, uh, he is said to have wept, thinking that there were no more worlds to conquer. Well, nobody knew about uh, the uh, Sino people right across there in China at that time, and the, and the culture that was developing there, quite an advanced culture, really. But uh, Alexander thought, no, that was it as far as you could go, because after all, there were the, these very intimidating deserts uh, beyond there and the uh, impenetrable Himalayas as well. Uh, so uh, Alexander thought, well, that's as far as I can go. And uh, his men, of course, uh, uh, his uh, soldiers had had enough and they wanted to turn back and go home to the West. Well, uh, beyond that, uh, for many centuries, the, uh, this mysterious Silk Road, the meand meandering mysterious Silk Road, brought into Europe the evidence that there was, in fact, an amazing, unfathomable civil civilization across there in the far, far east and uh, across from... from uh, that uh, area came on the Silk Road, the finest silk, uh, translucent porcelain, beautiful and uh, delicious tea, of course. Uh, and they came by uh, the camel trains and other, other perhaps other means of transport um, uh, done in, uh, in such a way that uh, groups of people would carry the goods to a certain distance and then they would exchange their animals and their goods and another group would bring them across further to the west and another group again. And so but nobody really knew the uh, far origins of those uh, wonderful goods. Uh, for Europeans, uh, the, the journey east through these impenetrable mountains, uh, these uh, terrible deserts, the endless wilderness, uh, the more marauding tribes and nomads that would uh, uh, perhaps uh, attack those that were going through, it was impossible to consider traveling right across to the east to try and find the origins of these goods until along came a remarkable man, a young adventurer, Marco Polo, a Venetian uh, merchant um, who uh, heard all the tales of what was across in the east and decided at a young age to go across and find out about it himself. And so he took the adventure across uh, the Silk Road and he was away from home for a total of 24 years. It took him three years to actually get across uh, to China. Uh, what a rugged journey uh, until he eventually came uh, to China. And he was the first of those uh, Western traders to make that journey across into China. And there he met uh, the fabled Kublai Khan and uh, his uh, wonderful palace uh, at Xanadu. Uh, lots of things have been written about Xanadu and uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, we might have learned about uh, his poem in school in uh, Xanadu did Kuba Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran down through the caverns, measureless to man, down to a sunlit sea. Well, it's a marvellous poem. Um, doesn't really directly have anything to do with uh, uh, the facts of Xanadu. But uh, Kublai Khan, a uh, famous descendant of uh, Genghis Khan, became the ruler of China. 
and uh, he, uh, he uh, though he was a, a Mongol, he adopted uh, many of the uh, Chinese customs and the culture, uh, and uh, established quite a, an amazing, absolutely amazing, certainly from the Western uh, traveller's point of view, uh, an amazing uh, civilization there uh, across in early China, or Ch early China compared to our day. Uh, so that was in the late 1200s. Um, Kublai Khan uh, uh, was uh, uh, treated uh, Marco Polo uh, quite well. He was actually a Western curiosity in China. Uh, they uh, really hadn't seen uh, a European. Um, and uh, the first, he was the first one there in his group. And Kublai Khan actually uh, took uh, Marco Polo into his, uh, his inner circle and actually sent him across uh, to other countries nearby as his trophy ambassador uh, on many international errands. And so uh, you could say that Marco Polo was fated by Kublai Khan uh, and uh, went away with quite a wealthy man after uh, 24 years away. He didn't actually go back through the deserts home. He sailed by sea, uh, which again was quite an adventure and uh, eventually got back to Venice. Now, when he got back, a book was published about all his travels. All the details were given in this wonderful book. That book was published, uh, The Travels of Marco Polo. You can still get it uh, in the bookshops today, uh, probably online as well, The Travels of Marco Polo. Uh, and so it was published uh, soon after he returned from China, but people just simply, simply wouldn't believe it. And uh, his own countrymen and others in, in Europe uh, looking at the book, said, no, 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 that can't possibly be. No, there can't be an advanced culture over there uh, in China. It's the book of a million lies, they said. And so nobody would believe it for quite a long period of time that uh, there was this wonderful civilization across to the east in China. It wasn't until uh, a couple of hundred years later, uh, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, that uh, exploration really uh, began uh, following upon Marco Polo's discoveries, and uh, the European nations began to search the world. And uh, so the age of discovery was born. Uh, you can see there on the map, uh, the blue represents the descendants of Japheth, who'd settled in generally the European area. And uh, it were, had been the descendants of Ham, who'd long before gone off into uh, other areas, having been scattered abroad, according to the book of Genesis. And uh, so the European nations began their discovery further abroad onto the other continents uh, and, of course, including China. The uh, age of discovery began, and it was mainly the uh, uh, Western European countries, uh, Britain and Spain and England and France and uh, uh, Portugal and, of course, uh, Holland. Uh, and uh, away they went, mainly by sea, of course, to discover uh, all the things and uh, and those who'd already previously been scattered abroad into these other countries. Uh, they missed out on Australia early on, but uh, finally caught up with us in Australia uh, towards the end of that age of discovery. It was during this time that the British East India Company was formed. And here was Britain's way of uh, obtaining all of the treasures of the East, particularly from India. Uh, the company was formed in 1600 and uh, began bringing the marvellous goods and spices and many other uh, uh, commodities which had been uh, discovered in the East and uh, traded with them back to Britain. And of course became very, very wealthy. 274 years that uh, British East India Company um, continued. Uh, it uh, became a very powerful entity, in fact a highly political entity, and uh, formed its own army, in fact, in India and uh, change a lot of the customs and cultures of India during that time. And of course, it traded with China and uh, brought back uh, the silk and uh, other goods uh, by sea back to Britain. What we're going to look at next time is this period of the hundred years of humiliation of China. Uh, beginning in around 1840 in the Opium Wars, uh, China itself refers to this 100 years of humiliation that uh, it suffered until after the Second World War. So we will be looking at the Opium Wars and the way Hong Kong was lost and uh, handed to Britain. Uh, the Taiping Civil War, which was the worst civil war in history uh, in terms of loss of life. And then beginning in 1894, the Sino-Japanese War, where uh, China lost Taiwan uh, to the Japanese. 
And that, of course, continues until after the Second World War. We'll be looking at all of that in our next session, uh, which is session number three, uh, China's 100 Years of Humiliation. So please move on now to consider part three. Thank you.